Good morning, everyone. I am Saurabh Paliwal from Biocon's Investor Relations team. And I would like to welcome you to Biocon's earnings call for the first quarter ended June 30th, 2023. I would like to, take, I would like to indicate that all the participants will be in the listening room only mode. And there'll be an opportunity to ask questions after the opening remarks conclude. Should you need to raise, uh, ask a question, please raise your hand under the reactions tab in your Zoom application. We will call out your name and unmute your line to enable you to ask a question. While asking, please begin with your name and your organization. Please note that the chat box is disabled, but you can raise any technical concerns by sending us an email to investor.relations at biocon.com. I would also like to bring to your attention that this conference call is being recorded. The recording will be available on our website within a day, and the transcript will be made available subsequently. Today, to discuss this quarter's business performance, as well as the future outlook uh, for the company, we have Dr. Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, our executive chairperson, uh, and other senior leaders from different businesses, including Biocon Generics, Biocon Biologics, and Syngene. I would like to also take this opportunity to remind everyone related to the safe harbor for this call. Comments made during this call may be forward looking in nature based on management's current beliefs and expectations. They must be viewed in relation to the risks that our business faces that could cause our future results, performance, or achievements to differ significantly from what is expressed or implied by such forward looking statements. After the end of this call, if you need any further information or clarifications, please do get in touch with us. With this, I would like to turn the call over to our chairperson for her opening remarks. Over to you, Kiran. Thank you, uh, Saurabh. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I welcome you to this earnings call for Q1 of FY24. And let me start by saying that the Biocon Group has started fiscal year 2024 with a strong revenue-driven first quarter across all our businesses. Before I dive into financials and business performance, I want to reiterate our commitment to delivering on Biocon's mission of enabling global health equity to affordable access to essential and life-saving therapeutics. We engage on this mission primarily through the three principal business growth pillars of our enterprise model, Biocon Genetics, Biocon Biologics, and Synge. While each of these pillars are at, a are at different stages of business maturity, we are very carefully and deliberately planning, building, and executing on strategies to ensure that each pillar is well positioned for differentiated and competitive growth to build true global leadership in the years ahead. As we do this, we keep at the forefront of our commitment to our four principal stakeholder groups, the patients we seek to serve, our people whose talent and capability aim to deliver our products and services, our investors for whom we strive to repay their risk and patience with superior returns, and our business partners who support and collaborate with us to achieve our mission. Let me now begin the business review and turn to our three pillars, the first being Biocon Genetics. In line with our business priorities, our generics business continues to focus on growing its product pipeline, creating and capturing value through vertical integration, with a clear focus on innovation and digital transformation. Building on its widely recognized strengths in fermentation-based products, we are adding capacities and capabilities in new growth areas, such as peptides, high-potent drugs, and injectables. We will also continue to direct our efforts towards forging strategic partnerships to accelerate our expansion into key global markets. I would now like to turn to Biocon Biologics, which is the next and biggest growth pillar for Biocon. We are building a unique, fully integrated global biosimilars platform, driven by the depth and breadth of our portfolio, R&D excellence, cost-effective manufacturing, global quality standards, flexible supply chains, and growing global commercial muscle. We have embarked on a transformational journey with the acquisition of Viatris' 
biosimilars business. To remind you, this strategic acquisition creates a unique, fully integrated lab to market and globally scaled biosimilars enterprise. It is well positioned to compete in the exponentially growing biosimilars market. In a recent market review by McKinsey, the global biosimilars market is predicted to quadruple by 2030, benefiting from more than $200 billion, I repeat, $200 billion of originator biologics losing exclusivity. In its new fully integrated form, with eight in the market and 12 pipeline products, totaling to a portfolio of 20 assets, Biocon Biologics has become a truly global player and is well positioned to fully capitalize on the enormous future opportunity. Having closed the acquisition in November last year, fiscal 2024 will see us complete the operational and organizational integration of Viatris's biosimilars business into Biocon Biologics, establishing the foundation of our fully integrated global biosimilars model. I'm pleased to report that we are making good progress against our plan, and I would like to provide you with some key updates. To ensure business continuity, we had entered into a transition services agreement with Viatris to provide ongoing operational services for a period of two years to complete the integration in a phased manner. I'm happy to report that we are tracking well ahead of this plan. On July 1st, 2023, we successfully integrated over 70 countries in emerging markets into Biocon Biologics. This, this successful integration coupled with a strong leadership team gives us the confidence to accelerate the transition of North America and Europe. And I can report that we will integrate all markets into Biocon Biologics before the end of this fiscal. Coming to Xinjiang, the third growth pillar for Biocon, with almost 30 years of experience, Xinjiang provides end-to-end -end therapeutic discovery capabilities, including differentiated research technologies and platforms across many disciplines, disease areas, and therapeutic modalities. Its extensive and experience and deep expertise have made it a trusted partner to many leading multinational startups and medium-sized enterprises, as well as non-profit institutions and academic institutions. <clears throat> With an established track record in discovery, research, and development for small and large molecules, Syngene is now building its capabilities in commercial manufacturing, offering clients a one-stop shop capability from drug discovery to commercial manufacturing for clients and more balanced model for investors. In fact, Syngene is now the premier and leading company offering biologics manufacturing capabilities. Now, coming to our full FY23 integrated report. Having reviewed our operational pillars, I would now like to turn to Biocon's ongoing commitment to ESG. Biocon's ESG agenda continues to advance. We engage with our 16,500 strong workforce to make progress towards our ESG focus goals, including building a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplace. In FY23, we evolved our core growth strategy to integrate environmental, social, and governance factors. Embedding sustainability into our corporate culture and day-to-day -day operations enabled us to continue developing life-saving medicines in an environmentally and socially responsible manner. Having closed an eventful FY23 on the business as well as the sustainability front, we are proud to have released Biocon's maiden GRI-aligned GRI integrated report. I'm also happy to share that Biocon Biologics has also separately released its first integrated report. 
I would encourage you to read the report and provide us with your feedback. Before I discuss the business performance, I would like to start with a board update. I'm pleased to welcome Rekha Merotra Menon and Nicholas Robert Hager as independent directors on the board of Biocon. Rekha is a leading industry voice on technology-fueled innovation and socio-economic progress. She was a key player in Accenture's growth for nearly 20 years including over seven years as chair of Accenture in India. She was the first woman to serve as the chair of NASCOM. Nicholas has over 30 years of experience in leading and building pharmaceutical and healthcare enterprises. He has held the position of chairman of Zentiva, CEO of Instant Pharma, president of Medicines for Europe, and regional director Sandoz. He's currently the CEO and founder of Health Cube Limited and a non-executive director of Zentiva. I will now present the key financial highlights for Q1 FY24. At the group level, total revenue for the quarter was up 59% year on year to rupees 3,516 crores. The biosimilar segment revenue more than doubled as compared to the previous year on the back of the acquisition of Viatris' biosimilars business. Research services grew 25%, while generics had a healthy growth of 15%. Homer EBITDA, which is the EBITDA before R&D licensing income, Forex and mark-to-market movement on investments, grew by 42% to rupees 936 crores, representing a healthy core operating margin of 28%. R&D spends for Q1 stood at rupees 315 crores, which is an increase of 117 crores as compared to last year, and corresponds to 12% of revenues ex Sinji. EBITDA for the quarter was up 69% at rupees 808 crores versus 478 crores last year. EBITDA margin stood at 23% as compared to 22% last year. Depreciation, amortization and interest increased by rupees 353 crores over last year. This is primarily related to the biosimilars business acquisition cost. Consequently, profit before tax and exceptional items stood at 184 crores and net profit for the quarter stood at rupees 101 crores. I will now discuss the business performance in a segmental manner and I will start with generics. The generic segment reported an operating revenue of rupees 700 crores for the quarter a growth of 15% over last or over the same period last fiscal. Profit before tax for the quarter stood at 64 crores with a PBT margin at 9%. Revenue growth for the quarter was primarily driven by our US generic formulations business, where we have benefited from additional contracts that were secured last quarter. There were also new product launches in key ex-US markets. And on the API side, we continue to see traction with our immunosuppressant APIs portfolio. We received one product approval from the US FDA, a tentative approval for lenalidomide capsules indicated for the treatment of multiple myeloma. On the regulatory front, we had a successful outcome of a GMP and pre-approval inspection of the oral solid dosage facility in Bengaluru which concluded in June with zero observations. This is in addition to the successful outcome of the Hyderabad API facilities pre-approval inspection in May reported last quarter. Both inspections are now officially closed by the FDA and we have received EIRs for them with a no action indicated status. Coming to investments being made for capacity expansion, during the quarter, we broke ground on a new injectable facility at Biocon Park in Bengaluru. 
This facility will cater to the long-term sterile fill and finish requirements for our generics business. Work has also commenced on the expansion of our peptide and fermentation capacity expansion in Bengaluru. These expansions are exp expected to be completed over the next two years. Now coming to biosimilars. First of all, I'm pleased to report that the market share performance of our key commercial products has significantly improved across key markets. This positions us well as we complete, complete the transition and build on the positive momentum. Looking first at the US market, we continue to see increasing demand for one of our key commercial products, Semvi, our branded biosimilars insulin glargine, and unbranded biosimilar insulin glargine, translating to a market share of 12% in June versus 8% last year. The higher NRX or new prescription shares of over 15% demonstrate strong ongoing adoption of our product. We continue to add significant new customers in the US with exclusive status for our insulin glargine which includes a large managed care network from July 2023, and more recently, another large payer effective January 2024. Ogibri, our biosimilar trastuzumab in the US has also steadily increased market share to 11% in June versus 9% last year, with growth coming from new customer contracts. Fulfilla, our biosimilar Pegfield grass team continues to gain market share in the US, capturing 16% share against 8% last year. The weekly market share in July has crossed 19%. It is now the biosimilar market leader demonstrating position and payer confidence. We launched Julio, our biosimilar Adelimumab in the US on 1st July, representing a key milestone for the business. The U.S. Adelimumab market comprises several channels, including commercial, Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Affairs, Department of De Defense, and many more, with each requiring different strategies for success. Biosimilar uptake for Adelimumab has been more gradual than expected across the industry. Our dual pricing strategy is expected to enable Biofarm Biologics to participate in all these segments and we are in active discussion with relevant stakeholders. On the European front, we continue to see strong demand for our products in major markets. Our Adelimumab garnered market share of over 18% and 10% in Germany and France, respectively. We have also seen a strong uptake of Abvemi or our biosimilar Bevacizumab in Europe with market share at 5% in May versus 1% last year. Biocon Biologics Emerging Markets business continues to see strong uptake of our flagship products, recombinant human insulin, insulin glargine, and trastuzumab. The integration of 70 countries from Viatris's biosimilar business allows us to expand our reach and portfolio within emerging markets. Now coming to financials, these increases in market share and the consolidation of the Viatris biosimilar revenues have led to Q1 revenues doubling over last year. On a sequential basis, we have seen revenues remain largely flat at 2015 crores due to phasing of the tender business in emerging markets and a one-off impact of rebates in the U.S. for our peg fill grafting. This has translated to a core EBITDA of 513 crores with margins at 28%. It is important to note that in the case of peg fill grassin in the US, the revenue and margin for the quarter were impacted due to higher rebates based on legacy contracts with select customers, which will normalize in the coming quarters. Post-transition, by the end of this fiscal, core EBITDA margins are expected to return to the mid-30s. EBITDA margin, consequently, for the quarter was at 23%, with R&D investments at 13% of revenues. PBT before exceptions stand at 24 crores. 
Moving on to regulatory issues. Yes, sir, Philly, our um, Aflibercept was the first biosimilar to receive a positive opinion from EMA CHMP recommending approval. We are also the first company to receive conditional approval for Aflibercept biosimilar from Health Canada with the final approval linked to ongoing litigation. The clinical trials for biosimilar ustekinumab and denosumumab are progressing well, and we are on track for filing by the end of 2023 and 2024, respectively. In July, US FDA conducted two CGMP inspections of our Malaysia facility, issuing six observations for drug substance and drug product units and two observations for the delivery device units. The inspectors did not identify any systemic non-compliance. We have submitted a comprehensive CAPA plan to the agency and expect to resolve this expeditiously. We continue to strengthen our global leadership team as we transition the operations of the acquired business. We have appointed industry veterans, Rhonda Duffy as the chief operating officer, and David Gibson as Global Head of Business Development. These appointments are in line with our commitment towards operational excellence and focus on new growth opportunities. In summary, we are pleased to see strong uptake in market shares of our products across geographies with a line of sight on multiple growth catalysts. Our business continues to grow with better performance of our products in existing markets such as Blargeen in the US, geographic expansion of our commercial products such as Adelimumab, Aspart, and Bevacizumab, regulatory advancement of our pipeline assets such as Aflibercept, Ustekinumab, and Denisumumab. Finally, coming to Sinji. Revenue from operations grew 25% to 888 crores over last year. Reported EBITDA was up 25% to rupees 235 crores, with margins at 28%. Profit before tax was at rupees 123 crores, up 33% over last year. The performance during the first quarter was strong, led by development and manufacturing services and well supported by discovery services and dedicated centers. During the quarter, Sinji took important steps as part of its strategic priorities. Earlier this month, it announced a deal to acquire a multimodal biologics plant from Stellis that added an additional 20,000 liters of installed manufacturing capacity along with a high-speed fill and finish facility. The proposed acquisition strengthens Sinjin's position as a leading biologics contract manufacturer and development service provider. Finally, Sinjin completed the acquisition of additional land in Hyderabad to support the long-term growth ambitions of its research services divisions. Together, these actions reflect meaningful progress on Sinjin's strategy to straddle both research and manufacturing services and give it the capacity it needs for the next stage of growth. In conclusion, I believe the Biocon group of companies has delivered a strong business performance this quarter, essentially a very robust revenue-led performance and established clear pathways for exciting new growth inflections. Building on their shared heritage, in Biocon's manufacturing and scientific excellence, Biocon Biologics, Biocon Genetics, and Syngene are now emerging as uniquely differentiated world-class players in the global biotechnology products and services markets. I firmly believe that these are very exciting times for the Biocon group, and I look forward to reporting our progress in the coming quarters. With this, I would like to open open the floor to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, to ask a question, please click on the raise hand icon at the bottom of the Zoom application. We will call out your name uh, once we see a queue assembled. We we'll start with the first question from Demente Kare from HSBC. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, my first question is uh, understanding the 
pricing environment for biosimilars a bit better. So ma'am mentioned about uh, Fulfilla seeing impact of higher debate uh, rebates uh, during the quarter, but uh, can you uh, talk a bit about how we are seeing uh, pricing for other biosimilars, say Simgly or, uh, or Gabri? Uh, because uh, in terms of prescription, we have seen pickup in all the products, but uh, when I compare uh, the reported sales, excluding uh, licensing income we have seen uh, sequential moderation so i want to understand the pricing part better max shares over to you thanks sir so you start and then i can uh, jump in after you're done go ahead matt yeah well, um so the pricing that we're seeing in discount trends they're not been uniform so when you think about your medical side or your pharmacy benefit side. Um, they vary by product and therapeutic area and by channel. Uh, and there's difference is in between each one of those. So taking a similarity that you would see in one product and comparing it to another does not necessarily translate. And so I think what Kieran had said in the beginning, uh, particularly around peg and there is a, a change in how we're looking at the rebates that were legacy. And what we're seeing on the other products, we are seeing very uh, active growth and good growth in those other channels like Simgly, Trastuzumab, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so specifically on insulin, what we have been hearing, I guess there has been a lot of focus on uh, lowering the uh, prices uh, from all the stakeholders in the industry. So uh, from Simgly's perspective, uh, did you see any such uh, uh, pricing pressure coming in? Uh, so you're, I, I believe you're talking about the wax that are changing in one one of 24. So as we're seeing it right now, no, there's not that pressure. Um, and remember on the Simgly, uh, particularly there's two channels. Uh, you have your branded and your unbranded, and we're playing in both of those. So there's a mixed variation on those rebates between low WAC and high WAC, but the mix continues to be in a positive manner that we're seeing with our insulin glargine and simply. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for your response. My second and last question is, post Julio launch, uh, can you update us on uh, what you're hearing from uh, pairs or what has been uh, their response and any discussion which is currently ongoing for uh, prices, et cetera? And how do you see uh, your share moving up in this uh, particular market? Thank you very much for the question. Um, these are very, very early days and the, and the payers landscape still developing. I think what's important that you've seen in early announcements this, let me remind you, the oversize, uh, the overall size of the pie is extremely large with the multiple opportunities we have and then the coexisting of multiple players. So just these early announcements that you've seen come out on the commercial side, and as Kieran said in her open, open remarks, there's multiple channels. Uh, not only do you have commercial, but you have Medicaid, you have Medicare, you have government, you have GPOs, you have IP, uh, I, I, IDNs. So these multiple channels allow us to continue to participate in many aspects as this market is continued to develop, which is slower. The overall market has seen the payers taking their time. But I think what's important to remember the attributes of our products and our relationships in Salesforce. We're very strong with our product in our two-click Julio product, which uh, lots of our uh, feedback from payers as well as physicians like. We do have a strong sales force. We are supporting hub services and patient services. And so we're in active discussions with all the payers as this market continues to develop, which you'll see over the next uh, through 2023 and into 2024 as this market continues to develop. And we're well positioned to participate. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, I'll mm -hmm. get back in the queue. Thank you. Thanks, Damianti. We'll take the next question from Bharat Ahmed from Avinda Spark. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good morning. Hope I'm audible. Yes. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I, I my first question is is on uh, the core EBITDA margins that you've disclosed for Biocon Biologics. It's at twenty eight percent this quarter, and and uh, I see that it was 
around 39% last quarter. So there's a sharp decline and you called out uh, the timing of some tender business supplies and EMs and higher rebates for Peckfield Graston. But uh, if you can quantify this impact of these, uh, that will be helpful because it's a fairly sharp decline. Yes, I think, Shiraz, you should explain this. Yeah, thanks, Kiran. Thanks, Arif, for that question. As Kiran said in our opening remarks, we've um, we've seen strong growth in our products overall in, uh, in North America, all our products, and we've shown the year-on-year -year growths that we've had. So clearly, the, the business is trending in the right direction, and our market shares are growing. We've had a situation with uh, with one product where we've had these managed uh, um, uh, care customer where the legacy Beatrice contracts that we had had a higher rebate, which was offered to select customers. Uh, that was in the region of around $15 million. That has been since reset. Uh, and most of those resets happened uh, beginning of this uh, current quarter, which is starting July. Uh, so what we are seeing from here on is that we expect these uh, to, to basically uh, recover over the coming quarters and we see business recovering to normal margins over the course of these, uh, as we take these contracts uh, again. Important to note, Harit, is that uh, July onwards, we've seen uh, peg trust in market share grow to 19% and we are now the largest biosimilar Peckfilgrastim or the largest Peckfilgrastim in the US market. So clearly that is a, a good recovery from where we are and we expect this uh, to, uh, to, be to get better over the coming quarters. Arit, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, uh, I was on mute, uh, that's helpful. Uh, my second question, uh, if you can share the breakup between uh, regulated markets and emerging markets for Biocon Biologics revenues for the quarter. Sure, that breakdown we can uh, we can offer. Chini, do you have that breakdown overall between advanced markets? And uh, in the past, Arit, we've given a guidance that it's been roughly around that 70-30 uh, mark. We can uh, we can share. So, Chini, what's the breakdown for this? We can share with Arit. Arit, morning. It's seventy-five percent advanced markets, twenty-five percent emerging markets. Okay, and a uh, follow-up: uh, the licensing income that you book for the quarter uh, that is uh, related to the regulated market uh, geography or or the emerging market segment. And and uh, one more question around the licensing income: uh, this this figure of uh, one sixty-seven crores. Uh, those uh, the license this income pertains to deals that were uh, signed during the quarter or these are deals that we've uh, you know partnered in the past and uh, the revenue booking is happening now yeah as we said even in in previous uh, quarters we've had this discussion uh, in licensing and out licensing is a part of our business and we will see this uh, as we decide on our portfolio and we will uh, in license product, and you will see that happen in a particular quarter, and you will see out licensing of certain assets that we may not see particularly wanting to develop or in a, in a particular geography, and we, uh, we will see that happen across a certain quarter. We saw uh, some of that happening this quarter, and that was the recognition of that 167 that you talked about. So you will see this happen in a particular quarter, may not necessarily happen in every quarter. As these opportunities mature, uh, or we make a strategic decision on what uh, and how we want to pursue our portfolio, you will see these uh, uh, occurring over and uh, uh, around every quarter. And it's a mix of, uh, you know, emerging markets and regulated markets. That's the way to look at the number. Yeah, I mean, it could be emerging markets. It could be an um, uh, advanced market, depending on how we are looking to uh, license the portfolio and uh, commercialize it going forward. All right. Uh, thanks, Riaz. That's all from my side. Thanks, Sarit. We'll take the next question of Surya Patra from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, so first, a clarification about this 15 million charge uh, relating to the peg full grass team. So is it fair to believe that this is a charge uh, because of the new contract and uh, relating to the, the next 12 month period? And uh, depending upon the pricing situation and the uh, reward situation and competition, 
a similar charge uh, on the product could come in the subsequent period or subsequent contract that is one and also whether uh, uh, this kind of uh, kind of uh, enhanced rebate and charge can come relating to other product like uh, health safety and all that Okay, let me respond to you, Surya, uh, on this. I think the, what we had clarified even in the opening remarks and now, this is about the past. So there are legacy contracts that were signed in the past as Beatrice is running the business today. And what we realized is that certain select customers in the managed care uh, segment had been offered higher rebates. So this is for business that is in the past. And those rebates are then passed on or discounts are passed on as they book the revenues. And those uh, had to be reset. What we've done now is we've reset these contracts. So going forward, that's why you will not see those things come in. And hence, we are saying that in the coming quarters, these things will get better. Big part of this is, has changed starting July 1. And hence, you are, we are seeing these improve right away. Okay. That, and this is that clarify that part, Surya? Yes, certainly, sir, but it will not be related, means we will not see any kind of charge like this relating to other products. We are not aware of any charge at this point on any other product. This is related to Pectril Grastim, and we've corrected that charge and reset those contracts. And going forward, we will be seeing those uh, you know, margins coming back to normals. Okay. Uh, now, sir, uh, just one another clarification I wanted to have. Uh, this, uh, when we talked about this uh, market share uh, for any product in the US, let's say, so is it the the total prescription that is really written, or it is the prescription that is filled? Matt, do you want to respond to uh, Surya's question? Yeah, sorry, Sriyasan, I I couldn't really understand the question. I apologize. Let yeah, me yeah. respond to uh, to that Surya a little bit, and then see if Matt uh, you want to okay. add on. Surya, these are the market shares that are reported uh, today for, say, Glargene, since you asked about it, our market share between the uh, branded and the unbranded uh, products, we have proved them, and that is at a, a little under 12% today, and that's what we're saying has grown. The new prescriptions are trending at around 15%, so that's a, that's a leading indicator of where things are going. And uh, Kiran did mention in her opening remarks that we also have onboarded a large uh, closed door uh, you know, managed care uh, customer. Those numbers don't get necessarily accounted for in the market shares that are reported. And we believe that's also a very strong indicator in terms of how our Glargin will drive growth in, in the uh, starting from the current quarter moving forward. Uh, but Matt, if you want to add anything further to that. Well, I think you covered it, Trias, and I apologize. I couldn't hear that question. Thank you. No, my question was, uh, uh, so recent studies indicate that uh, the prescription generator or written for any product in the biosimilars are meaningfully different than the prescription filled by the patients actually. So that is why uh, in terms of the market share when we are mentioning, so is it based on prescription written or based on prescription filled? I think I think you're asking about what we can see as current prescriptions and then what's being written new. And if I'm hearing you right, so new prescriptions give you an indication for refills or continued prescriptions in the future. And I think what you're looking at, particularly in SlimGlee or insulin glargine, if you're looking at the IQVIA data, you're going to see the trends of the prescriptions that are being filled, and then you can look at the new RXs. Normally, the indication of new RXs will give you a good read on how the trends of the prescriptions are going to continue to grow. Now, as Shriya said, when, we, when we've won this large closed network in July, those do not report in IQVIA, and that can vary your market share and understanding but what we're seeing is, is growth not only in new RXs, but growth in our partners, which will be closed doors networks, as well as payers. So hopefully that answered your question. Uh, if not, I will, I will try again. 
I yeah, think, yeah, sure. I think uh, Surya, to just simplify it, I think the 12% is the prescriptions filled and the NRXs are prescriptions written. Okay, okay, sure, ma'am. 15% is the trending towards how much extra is being written and 20% is really indicating how much is filled. Oh, that is really helpful. Uh, my second question, uh, third question is relating to the the integration thing, what you mentioned uh, in the opening remark, ma'am, about uh, the virus acquisition and its integration in the US, and that is likely to be complete by second quarter. So what practical changes that we mean by this? Because we know that the marketing arrangement is, or the marketing support we are currently taking from the Viatris for next kind of one and a half year or so more. So uh, this integration will bring what kind of a benefit, let's say, in US. So maybe Shreyas, you would like to take that question? Yes, thanks, Kiran. I think Surya, as you know, that we had signed up with uh, with Viatris for a two year transition services agreement. And as you rightly said, the commercial uh, uh, team that Beatrice had is a, is a part of that uh, deal that we had, which will be coming over from Beatrice to us. However, the reason we had uh, uh, you know, signed up this two-year transition services agreement is because there were functions that we needed to get ready outside of commercial so that we can actually run a successful business in the US. And we had given ourselves a two-year window to be ready with that infrastructure. Today, we feel confident having moved over 70 markets in the emerging market space. We are feeling quite confident with the leadership that we have put in under Matt's leadership and, and the other leaders that we've brought on board in the US and in North America and Canada. So we believe that we're in a good place to move the business over to be led by Biocon Biologics by the end of this quarter. And we also have a very good uh, alignment with the team that's coming over from Beatrice to us. Uh, and that's why we believe that we can accelerate this transition, bringing greater focus to the business that uh, will now be only focused on the biosimilars, uh, which should then benefit uh, what we are trying to achieve uh, as a company. Sure. Sure. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Surya. We'll take the next question of Neha Manpuria from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for taking my question. My first question is on, I think in the presentation, you ma made a comment about core margins, um, you know, going back to the mid thirties by the end of FY24. Uh, based on your comment that, you know, the one-off that we saw in rebates is, you know, whatever it should normalize. Any reason for why we should see a more gradual improvement in core margins? Uh, versus a full year guidance of, you know, uh, mid 30 to high 30 margins. Let me, uh, Kiran, uh, you're on mute. Neha, I said before the end of the quarter, I mean, end of the fiscal. So I think we expect to see it sooner, but, you know, basically I'm guiding for the fact that we have reset the rebates and hope that over the coming quarters, we get back to normalcy as Shreyas mentioned. Apologies, I was on uh, mute. Uh, so, ma'am, just to understand this clearly, we're still holding our mid-30s guidance for FY24, the core margin guidance that we're given for biosimilars. Yes. Understood. Uh, and my second question is on uh, Julio. Um, she is based on the, you know, contracts that have been announced so far and given that there's been a more gradual uptake, um, you know, in the entire Adali biosimilar uh, market. You know, what's your sense on, you know, when we can get clarity on how payers think about uh, allocating volumes? And, you know, uh, when when would we get a better sense on, you know, what the opportunity could be for uh, Biocon? Yeah, thanks, uh, Nea, for that question. And as Matt answered earlier, the opportunity is very sizable. So the Humira opportunity in the U.S. is a very sizable opportunity. Uh, we believe that you know this decision making uh, will happen over the course uh, of this calendar year. So we should have that uh, clarity on how things will evolve. There are commercial plans, commercial health plans, which will make a decision, which is 
uh, about, I would say, a part of that business, a large part of the U.S. market. But outside of that, as uh, as uh, Matt and Kiran in our opening remarks uh, uh, addressed, that there are several other pieces of the market which would be the managed uh, care market, the the Medicare market, and I think basically. While these decisions will be made during the course of the year, you will see, and we've said this in the past as well, that business will track forward from 23, leading up to 24, and you will see most of these things really consolidate towards 25. I think this is what we've heard from all other industry players as well. And that opportunity remains intact. And even from our perspective, we're very well positioned to to realize that opportunity given the, the kind of product that we've developed, the success that we ride on in the back of what we've achieved in Europe, and the kind of team that we've got, which is very well aligned to uh, commercialize uh, Julio in the US uh, with the product and the, the patient service programs that we've got. So we feel quite uh, confident in Neha as the decisions get made over the course of the few uh, months ahead of us. And in your assessment, Trius, uh, what portion of the market, uh, you know, the commercial contracts that have been announced that we have seen, um, you know, I, I assume this would be for the next 12, uh, 12 months. And what portion of the market do you think is already locked in and probably not available for us? So there are two things that, uh, that I want to draw your attention to, and I'll respond to two things uh, separately. One is, if you look at the overall U.S. market, the the commercial space is roughly 50% between mm -hmm. the, the large players and then there are a, a bunch of other smaller players as well. What we've seen made public so far are two um, commercial players, uh, two large commercial players who've made announcements. And if you, if you notice their announcement, they've said that they continue to uh, look at these as, uh, as an evolving thing. It's not mm -hmm. like this is it and no one else will be looked at. So we don't see this as a, as a definitive position. What we see is what is announced at this point is a set of, uh, of players who've been uh, enrolled on two health plans, and we see most of the other things still evolving as we go around. So that's why the commentary that uh, that Kiran had, Understood. these decisions are still gradual. Understood. Thank you so much, Riz. Thank you, Neha. Uh, we'll take the next question from Shyam Srinivasan from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Good morning and thank you for taking my question. Just the first one on the sequential run rate for the Viacon biosimilar uh, segment. Uh, how should we look at this as we go forward? Uh, we were expecting a faster ramp up. I know you talked about the reset in Bechtel Gaston as well as the tender business change, but how should we look at it as we move through the quarters? And a related question is just on some of the market shares that we had aspirations for, especially assembly, both branded and unbranded. You talked about the fact that MCOs don't get added in. I, I get that, but the high teams market share uh, that we were talking about earlier, is that something that's still uh, that we can certainly do? Uh, so that's the first uh, set of questions. So, Sham, let me answer that by saying that, uh, yes, the $15 million impact that we've seen in the rebate on uh, Pegfield Graston has also impacted our top line as it has impacted our core EBITDA and EBITDA as well. So it has basically run through our financials. Uh, so yes, uh, that is the, the, the re reason why you have not seen an uptick in terms of increased market share. Uh, the second thing is, of course, uh, we are uh, very uh, con you know, uh, encouraged and confident that our uh, performance in the US and many, many other markets is uh, showing good growth and we expect that to translate into both revenue and uh, you know bottom line growth. So that's what I would say at this point in time, but maybe Shreyas, you'd like to add something. Sure, thanks Kiran. I think uh, uh, Sham, to, to your question, uh, two things I would say, one is maybe also partly responding to what Neha had said. Uh, to, to, if you were to look at that 15 million and if you if, if you add that back even in the current numbers, I think like Kiran said to the revenues and to the core EBITDA, the quality of earnings is already at that mid 30. So the business that is trending today is already quite strong, both in terms of the, of the revenues that we are, we are looking at and in terms of the margin that it's trending towards. I think where the, where the aspect of, of the uptick is also expected is in the emerging market side, which 
as you know, a large part of that business is dependent on tenders. And, and as Kiran also alluded to in our opening remarks, some of this is going to be different from uh, quarter to quarter. And as you see those tenders realize an, an effect, you will see those uh, you know, move between quarters. But otherwise, the emerging markets business has done well. But the advanced market business has really been driving that growth. And we see that in place. And uh, your second question, which was related to Sendly, I think uh, the, uh, the closed door managed uh, care market, that customer will certainly add uh, a huge uh, muscle to that number because that's a, a, a single supplier situation, which means there is no other competitor. And we are seeing a very high degree of conversion from the incumbent to us. So we see, expect to see that driving uh, growth for us. We also see that driving market share. And outside of this, uh, Kiran also referred to another large commercial player. So this is the managed uh, care player, but there is also a large uh, commercial player who signed us on. Some of this will uh, sign up towards the uh, beginning of calendar year 24, which will then drive growth for us in the last quarter of this fiscal show. Um, um, uh, Shreya, so is there a change to the um, market share guidance on Sengli? I think that, that is where I was trying to arrive at. I, I think uh, we're still uh, tracking to that mid teams that we had said, uh, Sham. I don't think we we are moving from that just yet. There's no reason for us to to, to do things differently. Got it. Uh, and just going back to the opening remarks on Julio and the gradual progress and expectations have been, or rather actual has been slower than expectations and the ramp up over 23, 24, 25. Uh, just want to understand your experience uh, in Europe. Uh, you know, some of the numbers that you're sharing for Germany or, or France are pretty good numbers. So do you think that is something that over time gets replicated in the US or you think the dynamics are very different? Uh, so that was my second question. Would you like to respond to that? Yeah, yeah. Look, thank you for recognizing Europe as being very strong, and I agree with you. Um, what we're seeing there is good, strong, steady growth. And as we go through this integration, as Kieran talked about, and fully transitioning away from Beatrice by the end of the year, I, I see that continue to grow because we are going to have that 100% focus and we'll be able to drive additional uh, Adali built off of a great base of what we're already doing in Germany and France and Belgium, and then taking that into expanding that focus into other European countries. So we are very optimistic around maintaining that strong, steady growth in Europe and maintaining our lead positions within Europe, France, and then gaining traction in other countries within the European Union. Helpful. Uh, last question is for Siddharth. Uh, just on the generics business, uh, I think 15% growth. Uh, if you can just help us uh, disaggregate that into what, what is happening in API versus formulation. Uh, there's been lots of commentary around the generic pricing improving. I think you're, in your press release talked about new contract wins. So help us uh, walk through that, please, Siddharth. Thank you. Sure, Sham. So we've uh, seen many new contracts come in in the formulations business in the US. We have seen disruption in the US uh, coming from other generic players. And we, as a fully vertically integrated player, especially in the statins and immunosuppressant space, uh, has led us to garner additional market share. I think uh, when you track the IMS for some of the products uh, that we have in the market, it's uh, doing very well. We are getting closer to between 30 and 40% market share in the statins. And uh, soon we expect that we will be able to get additional market share for immunosuppressants. And uh, the bulk of the growth is uh, uh, from formulations, but as I mentioned that we've also seen a good traction of uh, immunosuppressants API, uh, which continues to be a focus area and a growth driver for us. As far as the pricing is concerned, uh, I think uh, there are mixed trends. We've uh, seen the pricing pressure taper down. We have seen uh, in prices stabilize uh, over the last few months, and we just hope that th this trend continues, and at least uh, that way we are we are able to grow sustainably. Uh, so that data point, just the split of uh, index into API and formulations. Thank you. See, our formulations business actually touched uh, 200 crore uh, this quarter. So out of 700 crores, uh, 200 crores is uh, formulation. 
and a little over 400 crores is uh, API, and the remaining is uh, other income. Thank you, Anand. Thank you. Thank you, Sham. We'll take the next question of Parth Shah from Bernstein. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Nitya from Bernstein. Uh, quick one on Glargene. If you can indicate what is the incremental lives covered that you can now address with the new payer uh, coverage wins that you've had? Mm -hmm. um, as you said, could we talk about the lives? Yes, incremental lives oh, that, yeah, that yeah. is now being covered with the new payer wins you've had in Glargene. Yeah, I, you know, as far as these are, are confidential right now, from the standpoint of uh, these closed door and the large payer, uh, I think what we continue to say is that it's really about the market share uh, number of lives, because we've seen that one of the closed door, if you're familiar with them, they will do pretty close to 90 to 95 percent conversion. And as we get into the latter half of this year, or the last half of our quarter in FY24, this is where the second payer will come on. And we're anticipating there, we will also be exclusive. Uh, so we'll start seeing additional pull through. But the number of lives do vary. That's why I didn't answer it directly. It's really about the revenue and pull through. And we are exclusive on both of those uh, contracts. So you'll see that uh, pull through uh, over a period of time. Uh, and the closed door will pull through already uh, and continue to grow as we go forward. Not trying to dodge your question, just that <laughs> lives aren't particularly the indicator. It's really the, the pull through with market share and are you exclusive on these contracts? Got it. I think I'll, I'll wait, wait for whenever you're comfortable talking about the payout. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, on Julio, uh, if you can let us know what is the status of your interchangeability study, uh, when are you filing it, uh, when would we ex when should we expect an approval? BI should lose their exclusivity in July, so will you be ready by then? So I think, uh, Nitya, thanks for that question. Let me respond to that. I think the interchangeability thing we we are seeing is uh, is something that we will be we are working on that study. We should be in a position to to give you more details about when we'll have it. We won't have it in July since you you have a direct question there, but we will have that study in play. And as long as you have that information together, we believe it'll work to our advantage. Got it. One last one, if I may. Uh, on Afribercept, I understand there is a litigation that's ongoing uh, between Biocon, Beatriz, and Regeneron. Uh, early August was when the closing arguments were supposed to be read. Uh, can you give us an understanding or understanding of when you're expecting the judgment to come through? So as you know, we are in an ongoing litigation on that. Uh, you know, we feel as, you know, as that is undergoing right now, there's not a specific date which has been set out and wouldn't be fair to, to comment anything further on it. But uh, but to say that we we remain quite confident and we feel good about uh, how things are progressed. All right, thank you. Thank you, Nitya. We'll take the next question from Tarang Agarwal from Old Oldbridge Capital. Hi, good morning. Uh, two questions from me. One, uh, uh, Chini, in terms of accounting. Uh, would there be any intersegment sale between the Holdco and Biocon Biologics? If so, what would be the nature of these sales? And second, uh, if you could give us the business-wise CAPEX outlook for FY24 between Genrix, Biologics, and Sinji. Thanks. Uh, Taranga, most of the sales of Biocon Biologics is to do third parties, to 2015 crores. Large third parties, there's very li little support services we provide to Biocon Limited or any of the other group companies. On okay. the Apex, I let Indonesia take the uh, group uh, thing, but BBS Capex uh, projections for the year is $150 million, largely for the Malaysia expansion as we're ramping up our insulin capacities. Uh, I'll, I'll take it for the generics and maybe Shibaji. You can talk for Sinjin. So, generics, we will be seeing close to $100 million of capex for next year, between 80 to 100. Yeah, thanks, Indranil. And for Sinjin, we'll be spending close to $85 million. 
and close to 50 million dollar of that will be in research business the rest of it will be in development and manufacturing yeah thank you thank you thank you taran i will take the next question from yash tanna from i thought advised go ahead uh good morning uh my first question was on uh, alcon biology so if i see the capital employed it has grown at a much uh, for the last 2 3 years grown at a much faster rate versus the profitability which has led to rocs coming down for the bbl business uh so my question is uh in the next 2 to 3 years do we expect uh, this trend to sort of reverse uh, because i th- i believe we are largely done with our expansions uh, and acquisitions and uh, a uh, profitability going ahead should support uh, return ratios yes that is the intent and that is what we are working towards right and uh, do we have a target number in mind ma'am uh, for the next uh, let's say 3 years down the line uh, we have uh, our internal benchmark set for the business so you do know that we are in uh, you know we are in the midst of the capacity expansion in malaysia and as you know you know the uh, the uh, sort of payback on that will happen once it's commissioned and as you know uh, all these capex projects in the biologics business uh, is a multi year kind of uh, uh, you know commissioning process and so obviously you we will start seeing the roc reflected at a much healthier level probably in about uh, uh, in fy uh, in fiscal year F- at the end of its fiscal year fy25 and beyond yeah no that's helpful uh, on the insulin side uh, i believe since we are in a position now to offer higher rebates uh, to the pharmacy benefit managers uh, have we seen any uh, impact benefit of that uh, 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 because uh, the uh, payer, the other uh, uh, innovator companies have uh, reduced the prices right i have not understood your question but maybe share us if you understood it you could answer yeah. it you know i i i think uh, what yash is referring to is the high vac and a low vac dual pricing strategy offers right. us the opportunity to do that I'll let matt respond to it and then if there's anything more i'll come back matt would you want to respond to yash's question yeah yeah sure so look um it it is a like i said before it's a mixed play with the rebates and look i just want to say this before we start on just the economics i mean we do provide additional value with our products like simglene or insulin glargine but we will remain competitive but the rebates between the high and low based on payer contracts can vary so as we look at the mix it's very important how we consider when we bid this process what's of the branded simply and what's of the low wac insulin glargine we do see variations and these variations are by pay, by payer or pbm or by customer so what i would say from a standpoint we are in good cogs position to maintain and compete with competitors and also to point out and lastly to remember the wac piece is just the list price um it's not the net and so when you see these wax lowering there's all kinds of things that can go into this but in closing uh biocom biologics maintains a good cost position and this is why you're seeing that maintain growth in the growth uh, of that profitability right well, that's helpful Fine. finally on the uh, debt side uh, is there any target number we want to reach by the end of the financial year 24 so we are basically looking at our debt governance and seeing how we can basically uh, align with that uh, and we will raise funds accordingly uh sure all right thank you and best of luck thank you yash We'll take the next question from Masira Vasanawala from FSSA Investment Advisors. Please go ahead. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask a question on the facility inspections uh, in the biosimilars business. So, uh, just you know, oh, we... Masira, we can't hear you properly. Can you repeat it? Yeah. Um. I'll I'll come closer to the mic. I wanted to ask about the facility inspections in the biosimilars business. just maybe could you help us understand why you know we're having another round of observations in malaysia um do we need to make more investments in people the processes etc um and then yeah just just how are you thinking about this 
Yeah, so maybe I'll get our quality head, uh, Michael Cutter, to answer this question. Yeah, thank you very much, Kieran. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for this question. I, I think it's a very important uh, question, and I, I'm sure many people have this. So the inspection that we had was um, in Malaysia was a, a routine inspection. We had had our previous inspection some three years ago, and uh, we had some observations, six observations for the drug uh, substance, the drug product, and the laboratory. So it covered that as a scope. And uh, we had two observations for our, um, our devices. So there were two parts to the inspection. The nature of these observations were, were not systemic. There was no data integrity. And uh, I, I think the, um, the way that I would characterize these as uh, these observations were they were, they were really um, demonstrating that we are making good progress in this facility. So there were no, there were no upgrades to the facility. In any case, we, we had the expansion project going on there, um, which, is, which is current thinking with, the, uh, with best practices in the industry. So there were no infrastructure changes that we needed to make out of this. These were mostly procedural. They were training of uh, some of our support people. Uh, these, this was the nature of the inspection observations. So to that extent, there was nothing that we, we intended to do in terms of structural modification to the facility. Um, does that answer the question? Okay. Uh, yes. And I mean, the fact that, you know, our launches are getting delayed because um, we're still waiting for the approvals from these facilities. Uh, is there more that needs to be done um, to sort of accelerate that? So let me answer that question, Masira. We have actually provided a CAPA plan which has been accepted for those launch uh, you know, approvals. And of course, uh, there are two uh, approvals, as you know, one is for insulin aspart and the other is for, ins uh, I mean, the other one is for bevacizumab. Um, the insulin aspart CAPA plan has already been accepted by US FDA and we're hoping that that is adequate. But, you know, we remain engaged to make sure that this is our understanding. The second thing is, of course, as far as the Bevacizumab, uh, you know, approval is concerned, that is in India. And that also the CAPA, uh, the CAPA has been given, the CRL response is also about to be given. So hopefully that should also get resolved, hopefully very, very soon. But beyond that, we can't really predict when it will happen. It's up to US FDA to really look at what we have provided them. We're hoping that the inspection in Malaysia will also further uh, strengthen uh, their, any, any concerns they have about approving as part. So that's as best as we can hope for. Thank you for that, Kieran. I think it summed it up very well. Masira, is that okay for you? Yeah, that, that answers my question. And just one more question. Uh, what is our net debt uh, today? Or as of the latest quarter? For the full company, uh, Siddharth? Uh, can I answer that? So, yeah, please, yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah, so excluding the structured investments, we are at 1.2 billion net debt. Thank you. Thank you, Masira. We'll take the next question from Cinderella Carvalho from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Thanks for the opportunity. Just a little more clarification on ASPAT and BEVA season approval. Uh, BEVA, uh, you mentioned that we got a CRL. Uh, was it related with the plant only that we are responding? Uh, Can you yes. please clarify? Yes, yes. it was actually uh, because of the facility in Bangalore. There were some uh, you know, observations we have basically provided a CAPA plan and a CRL response. So that's what I was referring to. Okay. And uh, in terms of our uh, BEVA approval, uh, do you see anything pending from our end apart from the facility? No. no there was, there's never been ever any scientific concerns about any of our programs. So as far as CMC and others are concerned, there's never been a question. 
In recent times, the only uh, observations uh, we've had in a pre-approval inspection is according is pertaining to the facilities, and that's what we've been addressing. Yeah, and on the ASPART approval, uh, do you think we wouldn't require a PAI sort of inspection again followed or in your mind, it's not necessary? Because in my mind, it's not necessary, but I just need to clarify the same from you. Well, that's what we also hope. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. And uh, just to Siddharth, uh, how do we see the generic growth given that you alluded to uh, pricing being more stable in US? Uh, how should we expect our overall growth trajectory from the generic side of our business? It will be guided for uh, mid-teen growth uh, this uh, fiscal. Uh, we would, of course, see a better second half because some of our facilities which were commissioned last year and we have uh, kind of uh, doing the validation at the state time and uh, we expect additional supplies to start in from these facilities and these were brownfield uh, <clears throat> capacity expansion so does not necessarily need FDA to come and inspect uh, as compared to the new greenfield facilities which uh, uh, requires inspection and adds more time for commercialization and we also are looking uh, at uh, locking in additional business in the US uh, on a formulation side and launching few new products uh, as we go along. We have already got few approvals and I think this quarter itself, we have two new launches uh, that are there. So should we look for a, a closer to a double digit uh, growth rather than a mid teens like a higher double digit growth? Is that well, that's what we hope for? Uh, quite honestly, it's higher team. I mean, the higher double digit, but uh, the visibility that we have uh, as we stand in the fifth month of the fiscal, I think I'm confident on the mid teens. But of course, we would see what we can do to get to the uh, higher double digit. Thank you so much, and all the best, team. Thank you. Thank you, Cinderella. We'll take the next question, which Vishal Manchanda from Systematics. Please go ahead. Sure, Thanks, for the, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Hope I'm audible. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my question is on the generic business. Uh, on the peptide facility that's going to come up in the first half, uh, can you guide how many filings we have on the peptide front and if possible, the total market that we are addressing through these filings? So we have uh, uh, around 15 peptides at uh, various stages of development, uh, of which we have already filed niraglutide in the US, Europe, and many other markets, uh, both uh, the strengths, Victoza and Saxenda, and they are being uh, reviewed by FDA as well as the European agency. And uh, we, uh, if you look at the overall peptides opportunity, uh, even though these 15 molecules are uh, addressing diabetes and weight loss and other indications, but just the weight loss and diabetes management market size is expected to be over $100 billion in the next uh, 10 years or so. So we definitely see this being a huge, huge uh, growth driver for the generics business uh, over the next uh, decade or so. So the other filings will uh, follow up. So liraglutide is done and the others will uh, follow yeah, up from there. That's right. Okay. And uh, second on the immunosuppressant facility, uh, could you guide on the peak sales potential and the uh, investments made there and the facility at Vizag? See, we have invested uh, close to 600 crores in that facility and uh, the, the, we already have a significant capacity in Bangalore. So this was an add-on facility and uh, we would be looking at locking in more customers, uh, mainly in the emerging markets where we also see a huge opportunity. But since our uh, capacities were locked in primarily for US and few large markets, we were not able to address uh, these opportunities. And we definitely think that we'll have a much bigger market share in markets like even China, where uh, we, we are looking at playing addressing that market uh, in the years to come. But in terms of revenue guidance, I think it will be a difficult uh, to give right now because we'll, of course, be selling both the API as well as the formulations, uh, which will be uh, uh, commercializing in these emerging markets. So the Vizag facility also houses a formulation facility? No, the formulations would be done in Bangalore. So we have only one formulation okay. facility for potent uh, molecules. 
Right. So, uh, if you could just give uh, a guidance on the peak sales for the Wisec facility, the API business. Uh, I, that's what I said. It will be a little premature to give that. I think we expect the revenues uh, to commence sometime uh, in calendar, second half of calendar 24. And we are, of course, in discussions uh, with customers to lock in and even with regulators where we, have, we are going to file from this facility. And I think we'll have a better sense, I would say, sometime next year in terms of the sales. We, of course, have internal numbers, which I don't want to communicate at this stage. Okay. And uh, a final one on Afli Versep, uh, whether we are uh, seeking interchangeability on the product? Yes, the uh, so Vishal, the Afli Versep product, will uh, we will be looking forward to that interchangeability. Right. And if interchangeability is granted, you might also uh, be eligible for an exclusivity there? Sir, I didn't understand the question. Uh, so, will you also be eligible for an exclusivity on Apple Versip, considering that you are first to file? And so, the uh, under the 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 regulatory interchangeability guidance itself, the first uh, interchangeable product has an exclusivity of a of one year since that uh, launch. So, you will have that as an interchangeable product. You will have an exclusivity to claim interchangeability. Got it. Understood. Uh, thank you. That's all for my side. Thanks, Vishal. The next question is from Nitin Agarwal from Dam Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, so that uh, on the generic business, uh, there are significant investments uh, you're making in the plants as well as in the R&D. Now we talk about fifteen percent growth for for this year. Uh, you know, from a growth revenue perspective, but. If you can just do some sort of crystal gazing on where, I mean, how do you see this business over the next three to five years with the kind of investments we're making and, and what are we, you know, what's the big picture story in on the generic business over here, given the fact that we started out in this business fairly late versus uh, maybe a lot of the other peers. So let me answer your later question first uh, before I come to your second question. So I think in, in terms of the overall big picture, for the years to come, we continue to uh, invest in our fermentation, which has been our core and what we have been doing as a differentiated offering for more than two decades. Uh, and we are building on to our portfolio and fermentation. So that would uh, continue to be uh, one of our focus areas. Uh, uh, the second is peptides. I think uh, the opportunity that uh, peptides offer, I mentioned sometime back that over the next 10 years, we look at uh, almost $100 billion uh, addressable market. Uh, and again, this has been, uh, while many companies are uh, attempting peptides, I think uh, this is really about science, cutting edge science. And uh, we think that the capabilities and the experience that we have had in uh, developing molecules like peptides, uh, we do have a good head start and we'll be able to play in this area very competitively in the years to come. And uh, of course, we are looking at injectables as uh, one of the uh, uh, focus areas where we would continue to forward integrate uh, some of these uh, peptides as well as the fermentation-based uh, APIs into, uh, into injectables and uh, offer thereby continuity of supply and for vertical integration to our customers. And uh, we will, uh, of course, continue to invest in our synthetic uh, pipeline, both onco as well as uh, non-onco, because uh, whether it's in the statins uh, basket, we uh, I mean, we you know that we have a leadership position in the statins globally, both in the API and now in formulations in the US. And uh, we would continue to invest uh, selectively also in the in the uh, synthetic. Uh, area. Now, com combining all the core strategies, uh, which I mentioned, I, uh, we over a period of next four to five years, on a Kager basis, I definitely expect a high double digit growth. Uh, uh, so somewhere between, let's say 17, 18 to 20 percent kind of growth uh, over a period of five years. And so that on fermentation, so, you know, on the business, you highlight Thanks, I understand. But on fermentation barring, are there any large but sub segments you're focusing on? We can become bigger going forward. See, uh, there are two uh, uh, two ways to look at it. In the existing capabilities that we have, we have not really worked on any new uh, 
molecules over the last few years. And then we are working on a handful of molecules. I mean, I'm, let me remind you that fermentation universe is not very, very large. So there's still a limited number of molecules. So some of the important molecules uh, which we uh, did not previously develop, we are working on it now. The second aspect is we are also looking at other areas of fermentation, like potent fermentation, which we have not, never done in the past. There are, you know, there's a precision fermentation. So there are other areas of fermentation where we can expand and we are evaluating where, where else uh, can we, uh, you know, uh, what else can we do, including things like microbial fermentation. Nice. And last one, uh, from a from an inflection perspective, at what stage do you see the profitability inflection in the business? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, of course, uh, when I, uh, you know, dissect our existing business, our fermentation business is quite profitable, but of course, it's being cannibalized by the you know, synthetic uh, uh, products, uh, which have been under pressure for the last few years. Uh, now, from an inflection point, uh, when we, exp uh, I think the margin expansion should happen for, again from peptides, both API as well as formulations. And, uh, you know, majority of the profits are going to be driven by few uh, molecules. And I think uh, copaxone or uh, glatiram acetate uh, is one drug uh, which, which we have which we are hoping that we'll be able to get the approval soon. Uh, and of course, the lira glutides and all. Now, these blockbuster launches are going to drive the profitability to higher levels. Thanks. And uh, you know, this last one, on what is the debt that is there on uh, the, the generic business, uh, X of uh, what's sitting in biology? Well, generics business is cash positive. I think it's almost uh, 1,100, 1,200 crores of cash. Uh, actually, it's almost 1,000 crore, and there'll be some dividend paid out uh, immediately after the AGM, but we'll still have say, seven, 800 crores of uh, uh, cash in the system. And so, just Ginny, uh, uh, on biologics, what would be the net debt situation right now? It's just above 1.4 billion net. And this is uh, taking the structured debt as equity or what you recently got? Excluding structured debt. This is the bank debt in, that we talk about. Okay. So and the, it, and earlier we mentioned something about the covenants. Uh, so that, do the covenants will require us uh, any specific fund infusion during the year uh, or uh, next year? We will calibrate it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Nitin. Uh, we'll take the next question, question from Ishita Jain from Ashika Stockbroking. Uh, hi, good morning. Thank you for taking my question. My question is on semaglutide specifically. You know, Novo Nordisk in the earnings commentary mentioned shortage in the molecule uh, and the demand is pretty strong. So is there a CMO opportunity for us in semaglutide? Uh, well, that's for, uh, of course, Novo to decide uh, if, if they want a CMO. Uh, there have been already a couple of filers in the US, so we were not amongst the first to file uh, for semaglutide, we have it under development and uh, we of course uh, expect that uh, we'll be on the 181 uh, day uh, for semaglutide. But uh, at this stage, uh, honestly, uh, you know, we have not explored uh, being a CMO because typically you know that uh, when these innovators look at CMOs, they don't look at competitors. So since we do have a product, a generic product under development, there are, it's unlikely that they will pick any generic player for as a CMO. And if, if at all, then they will bar the generic company to launch uh, their own uh, drugs. So, I mean, Novo is already working with pure play CDMOs uh, or CMOs uh, to manufacture a semaglutide. And I, I think that's what would be more... Uh, apt for them uh, rather than uh, looking at a generic company. Got it. And can you talk about the strengths we have for Sima Glucide that we will be filing for? Well, I think uh, it's the science, as I mentioned, that uh, these are complex peptides, uh, you know, to, uh, to develop, characterize uh, these uh, molecules does require a lot of uh, understanding of these uh, molecules and the, uh, the amino acids and how you kind of link them and uh, synthesize these molecules and that's the sense. I was asking about uh, the strengths. So I think we will develop both strengths. Oh, sorry. So the for strength. the weight loss and the uh, diabetes. Okay. I mean, oh. there are three uh, formulations for uh, semaglutide. The Regovi uh, 
the Ozempic and the Rebels as the oral. So we'll be developing all three. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shita. The next question is again from Nitya from Bernstein, a follow up. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a, this is again on semaglutide. Uh, so semaglutide, the registered process is a recombinant uh, process. But if you look at during discovery, it was actually done using a synthetic process. And I can fully imagine players trying to figure out a synthetic process because your COGS in operation operating efficiency is much better. So do you see that as a threat uh, to your cost position? And a broader related question, which is that if I look at terzipatide, I think it's a synthetic process. Uh, I know there are a lot many more peptides in the pipeline, but do you eventually see synthetic routes of synthesis being figured out for most of these and therefore your fermentation capacity is not really having long-term growth potential? How do you think about it? Contrary to, your, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, contrary to your perception, uh, actually recombinant uh, processes are more uh, effective and cheaper to produce. Yeah. I think the big question there is the clinical trials that might be needed uh, to establish, uh, you know, the immunogenic, uh, uh, you know, similarity. I think that's why people prefer to go down the synthetic route, but we have capabilities in both. And we will basically go closer to the timeline, decide how do we approach this uh, particular uh, opportunity. So we will have both the products, synthetic as well as recombinant. And I think that's what will be the differentiator compared to other competitors who mostly have only synthetic uh, product. And uh, the, uh, the regulatory part today, especially in the US, is more driving towards the synthetic uh, than uh, towards the recombinant. And as Kiran mentioned, uh, when you, if it's a recombinant product, then you need uh, extensive uh, phase one, phase three kind of uh, trials. And, uh, At least phase one. Phase one. Then. And COGS, I think Kiran already mentioned that uh, fermentation is uh, lower than synthetic. But when you look at the overall cost of the drug product, uh, it's uh, not a big differentiator in cost because majority of the cost comes from devices and drug product uh, for filling than uh, from the API alone. Thank you. Thank you, Nithya. We'll take... The next question, Sai Priyanka from Metsphere. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I would like to ask about SR filling. And what were the key points presented in the closing arguments of the BPCI patent dance, dance case between Mylon product and Regeron? And how might these arguments impact the approval and launch of the Mylon, uh, SR filling? Thank you. Yeah. So let me let me respond to that question. See, this is um, um, the, there are things on the argument that I won't comment on, which is in the litigation. But I will tell you that uh, that this has been a, a very different litigation in terms of an expedited request that was made, uh, where we are litigating on a on a number of patents which uh, are limited, and we will look to see how the interim judgment comes through. The, as, I, as I have responded earlier, there is a, a guidance date, but we don't know exactly how that will play through. Now, as regards to whether it has an implication on the approval, the answer to that is, is, uh, is only for the final approval. The approvability through a conditional approval, like we talked in, Kiran referred to in our opening remarks, uh, where Health Canada has already approved uh, conditional to the outcome of the litigation or the loss of exclusivity, basically. So that is where uh, you know it does not affect. You've also seen the European authorities uh, recommend the the CHMP okay. for approval, and uh, you know we're looking forward to the FDA do the same. So we look at uh, that conditional approval subject to LOE. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's the last question for today's call. I thank you for joining us today. If you have any further questions or need clarifications, please do, do get in touch with us. With this, uh, we'll conclude and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.